okay. Um, <laughs> All right, we are live. How are you, Leah? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Guys, if you're tuning in live, um, I'm excited for this one. The author of one of my favorite books, The Vegetarian Myth, um, which I've sent to probably dozens of our patients now. And I get this question all of the time. Um, should I be eating meats? Is it good for me? Why? Why not? Uh, we had one patient, young girl, and we looked at her bloods and she was anemic and had macrocytic anemia and all these issues. And she said, what do I supplement with? And I said, steak. Um, <laughs> and so we get it all of the time and it's a really interesting topic. And I came past your book. I was walking through a bookstore in Montreal and I was just kind of going through the health section. And I saw it and it said the vegetarian myth. And I thought that was a really compelling title because I can see how a vegan and a plant-based diet is compelling to many people. Right. Like most people that do it are not bad people. It's not that they're, you know, they, they're out there and they're hoping to save more animals, hoping to save their health, hoping to eat better and make better choices. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, how did you come up with the title? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was just obvious for to me from the beginning that that's what I wanted to call it. Like, pretty much from page one. Um, my publisher wasn't super psyched about it, but I really stuck to my guns. And mm. then it turned out that I was correct because I think most people have a reaction like yours um, that this book is gonna be something totally different and probably something that you either are gonna hate or really wanna read, but either way it's engaging. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a really, really great book. And I love that it's it's separated into, into the sections of health, environment, um, and, and the different topics, and, and you address the different topics. Um, but Leah, what's, what's your story with veganism? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, oh, first of all, this is my dog. Oh. <laughs> um, she's helping, and she likes to be on these interviews. She mm. has one. Th she has one thing to say to everybody, which is, eat meat. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> I should have listened to her. Um, I was 16 years old, and I was a very engaged and curious teenager. I was very concerned about the state of the planet, about you know cruelty and issues of injustice and all of, you know, sadism and why were we wrecking everything and why was there racism and why was there sexism and all, like I was just, just absolutely inflamed about all of this. And I met another teenage girl who's their her whole family were vegans. Um, and that's actually the number one way that people take up vegetarianism or veganism is by meeting somebody who's already doing it and they are convinced. So I was definitely convinced she had all the information at that didn't have the internet back then, but all the brochures, you know, the little booklets and everything and told me what to read. And I was just enthralled immediately thought this was, she had to be right about all of this. And some of it is, you know, still quite compelling. I mean, you know, when you see those pictures of the factory farmed animals, and really horrible conditions that they're in, I mean, that should yank at everybody's heart because it's horrible. But all of it, you know, it makes a really complete picture and it's it's very easy, right? Like if you just do this one thing, take out all the animal products, you can save the planet, save animals, save your health, save all the starving people. Like, all you have to do is one thing. So it wasn't extremely compelling. And within a week, I, that was it. I was done. I was going to be a vegan. So I went in, just dove in to head first. I was all of it. Like I just... This was going to be what I was. So, and I did mm -hmm. it for 20, 20 years. So that was, that was me. And, uh, I, that's did a long time. It was, it was, well, it's permanent damage at that point. You don't, you can't do it that long and not end up with some real problems. So mm. I, one by one, just sort of wrecked each part of my body. Um, not realizing, of course, that that was the issue because when you're in vegan world, you're not allowed to think that way. So, it's got some very cult-like elements. And that's part of the problem. It's a very fundamentalist worldview. And if you are, you know, any kind of a fanatic, which I certainly was, it's a hard road out. You have to you have to really be hurting before you'll, you'll consider getting out. And it was hard. So that day finally came for me, like it does for everyone. And it's not a fun process getting out. But, 
you know, eventually um, I did the right thing for myself and I learned a whole bunch more. It was so much information that I didn't have and that I wasn't willing to consider. And mm. one of the good things about getting out was finally, finally being able to engage with so much more information out there. And that really helped. Like, well, I'm not actually doing a terrible thing here. In fact, if I do this correctly, I'm doing the right thing for everybody. So all of that came later though. At first it was, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard day. You, yeah. I, I remember in your book, you told the story of um, watching soil and kind of trying to grow your own plants. And that was yeah. in the book, at least your aha moment. Was that the moment where you went, uh, I can't do this anymore? <laughs> well, the moment for me was really about my physical health, but growing my own food presented a, a huge array of problems that could not be solved as a vegan. So mm. I really hit the wall ideologically for that sort of two, three, four years while I was doing all of that because uh, there was no way out. It, the moment that you start growing, trying to grow your own garden, you've got these problems. One of, one of the first one is that there's plenty of animals that want to eat your food and you have to figure out what to do about it. And there's no good way through that as a vegan. Um, mm. And that includes a lot of insects. Insects are animals. Uh, and it was hard. It was really hard. And I couldn't bring myself to kill them. So I ended up having to abandon the garden more than once because I just couldn't do it. And there was definitely a moment. I, and I just remember this so clearly still. I So I kept planting lettuce and then the slugs did every single night. And then I would buy more, put the little starts in, slugs would come back. It was every single night I was having this problem. And I, you know, the, the sort of organic way to deal with slugs, I mean, you can poison them, but that's that's going to just bioaccumulate up the food chain. I wasn't mm. going to do that. But, you know, one of the best organic cures is beer. You put out little dishes of beer and they love it. They're drawn to it. They drink it. They drown. You know, they get drunk and they're dead. I mean, it's so I guess they die happy, but they do have to die. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, I'll do it. You know, I, I was at my wit's end. And so I put out the little saucers and I woke up at two in the morning and it's just a cold sweat. Like, what am I doing? I'm killing animals. I'm not that person. I don't want to do this. And I ran outside and I saved all the slugs and it was over. I was like, well, now I just have to accept that I'm not going to have a huge chunk of this garden because they're just going to keep eating it. And, but it was like this huge relief for about 12 hours. Like, I, okay, I don't have to, I don't have to be the person that kills animals. I can go back to being, you know, the super duper vegan that would never hurt a living creature. And I went to the grocery store and I, I just buy lettuce. It's so simple. And I mm. stood there in that grocery store and I'm holding that, like it literally it's in my hand. <laughs> and it was like this moment of just feeling yourself grow up because mm. having tried it, I knew, and there was no way back. I knew that whoever grew that lettuce killed those slugs. A whole bunch of animals died for that farmer to grow that lettuce. And I was fooling myself to pretend that there were not dead animals embodied in that lettuce. So for me to have that lettuce, animals had to die. And I could go on pretending that it wasn't true and I could pay mm. other people to do it for me, but there were dead animals in that lettuce. There's no way to get that lettuce without killing something. And it was a terrible moment and it was also a, a bracing moment and it was a good moment because it was like, you, you just have to accept that is the basic arithmetic of life you are happy to be alive. Every single creature eats something. For yeah. something to live, something else has to die. And if you accept that, you can do it well. It's the only way forward. It's the only way to be a responsible grown-up person. And take responsibility for what your life is going to consume. And it, all of that happened at once, like holding that lettuce in the grocery store. And it really was just this, thing, just this absolute turning point for me of just setting aside, you know, those childish things that, that my life could be this fairy tale where no animals were ever hurt for me to live. But it was hard and it was a long build up to that point because I tried and tried and tried. And the other thing that becomes really apparent, especially if you're going to try to grow organically and preserve your soil and all of this is that plants want to eat dead animals. Like there's no way mm, around that. You want good absolutely. soil. You have to apply certain things and it's blood meal, bone meal, like all of this manure, all of that has to go in. Um, and it was just ghastly for me. I just, you know, I'd go to the store and look on, you know, and then catalogs, whatever, try to figure it out. Isn't there some way to do this as a vegan? And the answer really is no. 
um, you know, it's like, well, I can buy mineral, like rock powder instead of bone meal or blood meal. But like, who are you fooling? Like, where does that come from? It's mined. And there's no way to do that without fossil fuel. How are you mm. going to grind rock without like massive equipment? Like, you don't even need to explain to me what that equipment is called. I know this is a massive dose of fossil fuel. Nothing about mm. this is going to be sustainable. On the other hand, there's blood meal and bone meal. Like, yeah. these are byproducts from people eating animals. Like, well, well, but I don't want to do that. And so, you know, it was just a terrible thing. And I ended up, I had friends who had goats and they had a barn and it was filled with manure. And they're like, well, we'll bring you some manure. So I did that. But it was like this sort of, you know, I'm, I'm sort of shifting the line at this point about what can I still call this vegan food? Like, I see no other option because there honestly isn't one, but are, they have the goats. I'm not the person that's oppressing the poor goats. They're doing that. I'm just sort of getting this byproduct that's the manure and I'll still call this vegan. But it was already collapsing. Like I was already learning way too much about where food comes from, the nature of agriculture, like what is this food actually and you know, where it comes from, what dies for it. And none of these were vegan answers. And it, it was tough. It was a bunch of really hard years. Eventually I got chickens. Um, they took care of the bugs for me. It was absolutely phenomenal. Like, that's what they do. They eat bugs. They had a great time and I had beautiful soil as a result and plants that lived, but uh, it wasn't easy, not easy as a vegan to, to have to face any of this. And, you know, eventually the whole thing collapsed, but I did try, like I, I pushed this to the absolute limit, like everywhere that I could. And there's mm. just that, you know, you just have to let it go eventually. It, there's no way to do it without just reality. Yeah. I love in your book where you kind of point out your own cognitive dissonance at the time where you were like, yeah. I thought this would work, but then it, it didn't. And you kept kind of finding different ways to justify why, why it might work. Um, it was a really big aha moment for me in your book when you pointed out that plants eat animals. Yeah. Uh, last night we were actually watching a video of a, a Venus flytrap. You mm -hmm. know, it, it traps a bug and then it yeah. kind of glues it and then it releases all these acids and dissolves it, which is like the most brutal way to murder yeah. something, right? <laughs> And this yeah, is a I don't think that's a good way to go. Yeah. And, and this is a plant, right? And and plants have their own protective. Everything in, in nature is about survival, right? And so yeah. they can't run away from you. They can't attack back. And so they release chemicals and they prick you and they cause rashes and goitrogens and attack the thyroid and attack so many things. And this is what plants do. So they're not inherently just good for us because they're a plant. Um like with everything there needs to be some balance right yeah well like you know tomatoes that seems like a vegan food but you know mm. tomatoes along their stem they have little tiny tiny thorns they don't hurt us because they're so small but if you think about how prickly a tomato stem feels and mm. they i mean insects get stuck to that stem and then the plant just like sucks the juice out of the like literally just eats the insides out of slowly mm. over time once it's paled that's what tomatoes do like <laughs> so here, here's my question then what as a righteous vegan right uh, believes mm -hmm. this kind of ideology what do you eat that doesn't involve death like what can you eat that doesn't involve you death? can't that's the What's thing the like goal? there's you, there's nothing left to eat and i remember you know learning about fruitarians I'm like well they just eat the fruit because you know Plants, various like apple trees, they make apples, and and they they the, that fruit wants to be eaten because then we transport the seeds, and so that's you know there are plants that have done that. They've made a bargain with other animals, either to get pollinated or to carry their seeds around with them somehow, and that's sort of the trade off. Is you know we'll make a sweet little package, and now various animals will have it, and then you're going to take our seeds and poop them out somewhere, and there'll be another apple tree. And uh, you know, fair enough, that's a good bargain strike with animals but you know having tried to grow to grow fruit trees they need minerals big time and mm. where are you going to get them like it's just i know where those come from you're either going to get the ground up rocks that you know vast quantities of fossil fuel and mining or you want a real closed loop yeah you're going to be using dead animals to do that that's mm. what goes to an apple and you know again that was really hard for me to face because Oh, what could be better than an apple? You're not even hurting the plant to eat it. They want to give you that fruit. Well, true enough, but you know, to make that fruit, they're eating some stuff that is not vegan. Yeah. So there's nothing. At the end of the day, there's nothing. 
And that's really even just one on one. That's not even talking like the massive destruction that, that agriculture has caused across the globe. And that to me, that was the really like horrifying thing that I didn't want to face at the beginning and that, you know, and that, I had that to face is, ultimately, but yeah. That's such a impact compelling topic as well, because I think industrial agriculture is a problem. I don't think that meat eating is a problem. I, I grew up on a, well, I didn't grow up on a farm, but my granddad owns a farm in Europe and I was born there and lived there. And every summer we would go and I would watch him love his animals and he still does. And he had sure. two cows and eight chickens and pigs and a little farm. And they kind of were self-sufficient for the most part. Sure. And didn't have a grocery store in that village until maybe 15 years ago. Right. And he managed to produce enough for his family and also right. leave some milk on the front door so that the neighbor yep. who grew potatoes could swap yep. milk, right? Yep. And mm -hmm. that's how they lived and yep. they still do. And yep. he managed to make that work without taking so much from the environment that he destroyed it. Right. And then right. industrial agriculture came along yep. and things started to go wrong. So the question that I have, or the argument that a lot of vegans will make is, well, the only reason we grow so much soy and wheat is to feed cattle so that people can eat cheeseburgers. Nope, it's not true. <laughs> Even with factory farming, which I think we can all agree is pretty horrible, um, mm. they're only eating, that. what those animals are fed is only about 13% of it is actual grain that you or my, I might eat if we mm. ate grain. The rest of it is um, either just straight up grass and leaves or what are called agricultural byproducts. So it's things that we can't eat. It's things we can't digest. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I think we all know just instinctively that breakfast does not involve going outside and eating grass and leaves. Like that's not a thing humans can do, or we'd be mm. doing it. That would be pretty easy. Uh, we can't digest that. We have no way to extract nutrients from that food. But cows can, like lots of animals can. That's their place in you know, whatever the food chain, whatever you want to call it, that's their, you know, their part in the trophic pyramid. That's what they do is they eat cellulose and yeah. they turn it into their bodies and we can't do that. So most of what they eat is stuff that we can't eat. So even if you want to accept, you know, just, just take as a given agriculture, you know, humans only want the tiny little seed on the wheat or the corn or the soy or whatever, the rest of that plant, the stalk, the leaves, um, whatever comes processed off of like the brand, the stuff that we don't want. What are you going to do with all that stuff? Well, the easiest thing to do with it is feed it to a cow because mm. they can digest that and they will turn it very nicely into milk and meat. And it only, they can use, uh, I think it's 0.6 kilograms of plant protein to make one kilogram of meat or milk. So it's a very um, useful conversion for everybody. It, that's what they do. So they're not eating, they're not generally in competition with things that, that humans eat. And it's, I mean, a lot of, I got sucked into that. I mean, I used to go around saying that all the time, oh, it takes 18 pounds of corn to make a, it's just not true. Like that's mm. not what they eat. That's not the quantity of it that they eat. And they shouldn't even be eating it at all. I mean, what cows are designed to eat is actually grass and yeah. nothing but like when they eat grain it actually kills them if they do it for more than a few months so even the worst factory farming situations for um, beef cattle they still spend most of their time out you know on the range eating mm -hmm. essentially grass and then it's the last month or two of their lives when they're sent to, to quote fatten in the feedlots so that's when they're getting all that corn but the corn kills them i mean it's way too acid for their stomachs it's not an appropriate food for them it like literally burns a hole in their stomach and those, when they're sent to slaughter, I mean, they're very sick animals. They're, they're being poisoned, essentially. Their livers are all, you know, um, inflamed. And it, there's, there's, it's just such a bad thing to be feeding them corn. And we only do it for two reasons. And the first reason is that it makes them fat fast. So in mm -hmm. terms of capitalism, there's profits made. But the, the underlying reason for all of this is honestly what's called the Green Revolution. Um, because starting in 1950, we started to produce this absolute mountain of surplus corn. And that was all because scientists had figured out how to make usable nitrogen out of fossil fuel, out of oil and gas. Mm. And with that kind of fossil fuel, and then they bred the plants to be super short, so they didn't waste much energy on the stem and the leaves. And they made the, the grain as big as it conceivably get like those genomes have been pushed as far as they're going to go you couldn't make them any shorter they'll fall over um but uh what it meant was with the input of fossil fuel that 
this absolute mountain of surplus grain was created um, across the North American, what used to be the prairie, that whole sort of bread brass basket area. And this happened all around the globe. Now these, these crops take huge amounts of inputs. They take four times as much water. Um, obviously you can't do it without all the fossil fuel. And what's created at the end of it is just huge amount of cheap corn. That's suddenly where CAFO is the confined animal feeding operations. That's where factory farming comes from. Before that, it didn't exist. Um, it didn't make any economic sense to keep cows in many cities <laughs> and feed them corn. Like nobody would have ever done that. But with corn that cheap, it suddenly made sense. And that's the only reason it became that cheap was because of this whole industrial process. So they kind of put the the cart before the horse when they say that, you know, all of this is the problem with cows. It's like, no, the cows are being super mistreated. The only reason any of this happened was because of the fossil fuel and, you know, the technological advancement of the Haber-Bosch process and figuring out how to extract that nitrogen. Um, and it's been a disaster the world over. I mean, it's probably the worst thing that's happened to the planet. Yeah, but, you know, here we are. So, but it, it's nothing to, it's not the cow's fault and it's not the meat eater's fault. That's, that's not how the political economy of any of this is working. Yeah. And I mean, corn being subsidized and here in Australia, wheat being government subsidized and so much incentive for farmers to grow it. Right. And so what yeah. do we do with that? And that's something that I, I learned, I think when I was like 19, I went to a butcher and I said, is your, is your beef grass fed? I used to always try and find grass fed and said, it is, but it's grain finished. Right. And he said, it's all, most beef is mostly grass fed and grain finished for those last 13 to 14 days. So when you watch these documentaries, a game changer and all these, I mean, every year there's a new vegan documentary that comes yeah, out yeah. and, um, and you see the kind of the, the brutal nature yeah. of factory farming, of course, like as a human, you go, Oh, that's, that's, you know, I don't want to contribute to that. Yeah. Right. I don't want to participate. I want to contribute. Um, but I find the people that go kind of hardcore vegan are the ones that are the most disconnected from food and animals. Like I've growing up on with my granddad on the farm, I literally in front of my eyes saw him slaughter a pig for us. And we would then eat all of the pig. Sure. <laughs> and then get a new pig and raise it and love it and then slaughter that pig. And you kind of you you see the damage that you're doing, so you want to contribute back to the environment and, and nature. And most people I find these days, especially in kind of our modern society that go vegan, are absolutely disconnected with that. Like they've never actually hunted for their food or seen an animal being raised. They've gone to the supermarket and bought the thing with the packet that says vegan and gluten-free yeah. and organic certified <laughs> and yeah. assume that it comes from a, you know, a, a good place. They really have no idea. I mean, I definitely didn't. I just thought as long as there's not a dead animal on my plate, it has to be the good food. And I just could not have been more wrong that when I finally understood the nature of agriculture, it was just like, this is a nightmare. And this is, this is why, this is how we've wrecked the planet. It's the single most destructive thing that humans have done on planet earth. Because what it is is biotic cleansing. I mean, you take a piece of land and you clear every living thing off it. And I mean, down to the bacteria. And then mm. you plant it just for humans. So all of those plants and animals have nowhere to go. So it's mass extinction. And that is what has happened around the globe. As of right now, every day, 200 species are going extinct each and every day. That's 200 of our kin, you know, plants and animals that will never come again um, mm. are being wiped out. And this is because we keep taking all the land. Um, so that's problem number one is the mass extinction, the biotic cleansing. And problem number two, that every time you do this, you are, of course, destroying the topsoil. So this is an inevitable problem that you're using up your land. And then once you've turned it to desert, you then have to go out and get more land. Well, generally speaking, there's somebody else already living there. Mm. So that's why agricultural societies end up militarized. And they always do um, because they have to conquer their neighbors and take their stuff after they've used up their own. Um, and that's what a city is, is people living in densities uh, such that they require the importation of resources. They have used up their own. They, they, they don't have anything left. It's all been paved or used or destroyed. So the food, the water, the, the energy, the trees, the fish, everything has to come from somewhere else. And that's mm. the pattern of civilization is you have this bloated power center, the city right in the middle, and then 
all the conquered colonies around it, um, eventually the entire thing collapses because, yeah, you can keep taking more, but eventually you're using that up too because it's an inherently destructive process, soil especially. Um, there have been 34 civilizations. Every last one of them has collapsed and they last as long as the soil. So somewhere between 800 and 2,000 years and then it's over. And the yeah. last proteins in the cooking pots are human, which is to say, not pretty, but it ends with cannibalism when people are starving. That's the fate Absolutely. of every civilization. So this one's not gonna be any different. We extended it a whole bunch by adding fossil fuel, but all that happened was the human population quadrupled um, since 1950, that's what happened. So this problem's not gonna go away. We've just made it four times worse. Hmm. I think it's such a shame that, you know, the whole vegan versus carnivore and humans amongst each other have become the enemy as in this this group of people that eat this particular way is the enemy when really we should all be fighting the common enemy. I know. Which I is know. Yeah. industrialized agriculture, yeah. destroying topsoil, um, you know, destroying rainforest to plant, uh, you know, to, to make oil, oil, whatever. Palm yeah. oil to make yeah. freaking Awful vegan stuff. candy. Like it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's all insane. So I think absolutely if, if we all come together and kind of uh, deal with a common enemy, I think it would be much more efficient. I have a comment here that I want to address. Someone said, uh, type A blood types are definitely better vegan. Most and every symptom I had went away and organs healed being vegan. Um, here's what I have to say about that. And, and, you know, if you have a different opinion, please jump in. But anytime somebody goes away from a Western type of diet, whether it's vegan or carnivore, or they do some form of elimination, their body will go through a period where they essentially starve. And that has healing benefits. We recycle cells, we have better digestion, and things get better in the short term. And the longer you do it, like yourself, for 20 years, the more resource resources you kind of drain, the less metabolic resilience you have, and the sicker you become. Eventually, you start to eat yourself, which is where you start to get problems with muscle tissue, muscle wastage, um, thyroid issues, autoimmune issues, uh, digestive problems. It becomes a, a, a shit show, to be honest. But in the short term, I think people experience a benefit with vegan diets and they go, I feel so much better. I have so much clarity. And it's because they've stopped eating one, uh, as many calories. So they're starving a little bit and their brain is kicking in that survival mode and the body is recycling old cells and they get a healing benefit. But if you do it for long enough, I think you will absolutely run into some trouble. Yeah, you're on nutritional drawdown. Um, there's just way too many nutrients you can only get from animal products. Sad to say, mm -hmm. that is the case. We evolved as carnivores. We did not evolve as plant eaters. We just don't have that kind of a digestive system. So, and you can store some of that for a while in your own tissues, but eventually the rubber's going to hit the road. You will drain them all out. There will be none left, and then you're going to end up with serious damage. So. I mean, I got a, I remember getting a letter from a, a guy, in, a doctor in Germany who's a neurologist. And he wrote me this really beautiful letter that, that every single week he sees their vegans who come to his office desperate for help. And they have permanently damaged either their sight or their hearing by being mm -hmm. vegan. And he was so grateful for my book because it's the only way through is they really need to hear it from what's in there. And your book does a great job of you know kind of helping them out and he was just so pleased to have something to give them but you could just tell he was so just sad like just so sad for these people like how you permanently damaged your eyesight doing this mm. like this didn't help anybody and there's no way back from that it's just it's dreadful stuff like i know it's what i did i thought i was saving animals and saving the planet and all i did was i gave myself three autoimmune diseases and i wrecked my spine you know, like that's yeah. not coming back. So what did you eat then? And what do you eat now? So I was like a super, super pure vegan. I like, I didn't eat white flour. I wouldn't eat white sugar. It had to be whole grain, whole beans. And I mean, I, you have to remember, I started doing this in 1981. So a lot of the stuff that's exists now for vegans didn't exist then we mm. didn't have all those weird little meat analog like fake pepperoni and fake bacon and like the fake vegan cheese is like none of that existed so it was actually easier in some ways to be like a healthier vegan because that stuff's just pure poison all that yeah. so I just 
don't even want to go near that. So, I mean, we mostly ate like rice and beans um, and a lot of vegetables and some fruit. But, you know, you, you, whether you call it sugar or not, it's mostly just sugar. Um, and even though I wasn't eating white sugar, of course, the blood sugar problems get worse and worse and worse, like every week that you do that kind of diet. So, I mean, I ate an awful lot of sweet things. Um, I thought it was okay because it was vegan and also not white sugar. It would be like maple syrup or a kind of whole, you know, like mm. a whole food kind of sugar, but um, you know, it doesn't matter. And I, you know, the thing that I really didn't understand was that, yeah, you can call it a complex carbohydrate and it might look like brown rice, but in your intestines, that is of course broken down into sugar. So Absolutely, yeah. it's all sugar at the end of the day. Like that's how it's absorbed into your body. It has to be broken down in just be small to get through the brush border and into your bloodstream. And that's mm. what your body does. So yeah, I mean, it might be slightly better if it's a whole grain, but uh, it's just sugar at the end of the day. So that's well, what I was eating. Um, but I was like super, super pure about it. I mean, I wouldn't even eat like jelly or ketchup if it had sugar in it. Like I only buy mm. very specific brands. I was like trying to be so good and it didn't matter. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, it was just, I still blew through my insulin receptors, you know. And that's, up, like, that's the thing. A lot of vegans... A lot of vegans yeah. make that argument, like, you know, you just, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And every time you, you admit how bad you feel, it's like, well, just double down and do it more and maybe try a fast for three days or wheatgrass juice. And I'm like, oh, it just, it's ridiculous. It just, mm. you just have to face the facts, you know? So that was hard. Um, but, and the other thing I, for me that was, I mean, I was the last holdout really in my friendship circle. There were, like everybody before me had already kind of given it up and not everybody had admitted it. But, you know, once I finally said, okay, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm just telling you all I'm done with this. And there were all these people in my life who were like, yeah, I've been eating meat every morning for, for years now. I just didn't want yeah, to tell you. And, tell you know, like they just, really, it's not worth, you know, the, the struggle session that you're going to have to endure at that point. But I was amazed how many people, some of them had been quite upfront with me. They're like, like, I'm just telling you what I'm doing. And, take it or leave it. And I was like, no, you can't give up. You could still be a vegan. You just have to try harder. And they're like, dude, I've been trying for a decade. I feel terrible and I'm eating fish and I feel dramatically better. And honestly, you would too. And I was like, no, I can't ever do that. So, mm. you know, it's hard. It's, it's a yeah, bad yeah. day. Yeah. When you were eating that way, um, you, in your book, you mentioned that you developed degenerative disc disease. Oh, yeah. Um, what I <laughs> see most common in blood tests, and we've looked at thousands of them, is uh, some form of anemia, yeah. um, severe B12 deficiency, despite even if they're supplementing, um, yeah. which, by the way, leads to psychosis, which oh, yeah. Oh, also yeah. is likely why the ideology. And, but anyway, yeah. we'll get into that. Um, you had degenerative disc disease. What else did you experience symptom wise at the time? So I also ended up with gastroparesis. So I destroyed my body's ability to. Um, I have to take betaine hydrochloride, so my stomach doesn't really produce hydrochloric acid anymore. So I've been taking that since, God, I think maybe 2004. Um, I'm still taking it. it. I need it every day. So that might be one of those permanent things as well. So, And I can explain how that happens for those who don't understand it, but it has to do with the, the blood sugar cycle and that you can, in fact, suppress your, your body's ability to and that's hydrochloric what, acid and you can do it forever. People say, so. people say, I eat meat and I feel so bad. There's somebody in the comments who said that. I, you know, when I eat meat, I feel so bad. It's because you don't have enough acid to. You don't. Because yeah. you've wrecked it. You wrecked it. And this is how. Um, every mm. time you've got too much sugar in your blood, it's a biological emergency. And your body says, oh, no, you're going to die. And that's true because our brains especially <laughs> can only exist in a really narrow range of blood sugar. So you've pushed it too high. So. Emergency outcomes the insulin from your pancreas. And that's an emergency response. It's a very blunt instrument. So insulin's job is it gets through your bloodstream as fast as it can and it grabs everything, shoves it out into the cells for storage so that your blood sugar will now be at a level where you're gonna survive it. Um, the problem is being a blunt instrument, it takes out too much. So now your blood sugar is too low. So now you have that terrible feeling where you're shaking and you're sweating and you feel like you're going to die if you don't put food in your mouth. And that's true because now your blood sugar is too low. It's below the level that your brain needs. So now you're like, oh, I have to have something. I have to have something. Um, and being a vegan, what you're going to eat is 
another round of carbohydrate. So in it comes, more sugar. Now it's too high again. Oh no. And so mm -hmm. the insulin response, and now we've got to turn. So that whole thing goes on. And you know, by the end of being a vegan, I was eating semi constantly. I mean, it was like every 10 minutes I had to put something in my mouth, completely mm -hmm. insane. And you think that's normal because it doesn't happen the first day. It takes a few years. And then every year you do it, it gets a little bit worse, a little bit worse, and you don't realize. Um, but one of the other uh, hormones that your body releases to take care of this problem is adrenaline. So adrenaline's job is to kick you into high gear because you're about to die because there's a lion coming at you and you need to mm. run or fight, punch it in the face or you know wrestle, whatever you're gonna do. You need a lot of energy to your big muscles as fast as you can, which means you don't want to digest anything right now. Like every last bit of energy is going to go to your, you know, your arms and your legs. So your body shuts down digestion so that mm. all your energy can be used elsewhere. So this is why in times of like intense stress, people have things like diarrhea. Like, you know, you hear that when, you know, like people literally poop their pants when they're, yeah. you know, soldiers in the army or something like really horrible kinds of life threatening experiences. That's an, you know, that's a thing that happens. And that's why your body is like, get rid of it. No more food. You just need to fight for your life. So yeah. you do this over and over and over again, three, four, six, ten times a day. Um, that's how your body does it is it shuts down all of those enzymes and the various chemicals that you use to digest your food, the main one being hydrochloric acid. And so your body says, we're not doing that right now. No energy is going to, to digesting food. You're just going to live through this experience and then we'll get back to talking about food. So you do that over and over again over many, many years, and you've perma permanently damaged your body's capacity to do that. And that's exactly what I did. Um, mm -hmm. And taking the betaine hydrochloride was an utter miracle. After feeling like nauseated for 15 years, I couldn't believe it. It was one of those like super easy fixes that like three days in, I was like, wow, I don't feel sick all the time. I just got to take this stuff. And so, mm. I don't know, it's definitely a trick I've passed on to other recovering vegans, especially you know, like the blood sugar problem people. Like, just try this, I, you know, try Absolutely. it for a few days. You will feel so much better. So I did that for sure. Um, I did end up with three autoimmune diseases. So it started with, oh, guess what, Hashimoto's. Um, and I, I also have, uh, well, that's the soy for sure. Mm. Um, and then I also have um, psoriatic um, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So yeah. that's no fun. Uh, I got those. Um, the disc thing, the, the spine thing is probably the worst of it. Um, I had some problems that got better. So like I had really, really dry skin, so dry it hurt. I mean, it would keep me up at night. It was so bad. And mm. I just thought that was normal because it doesn't come on again in one day. You know, it takes a few years to get to that point. But the first thing that I started eating when I was coming out of veganhood was eggs. That was like mm. the, the easiest thing for me to decide was okay. And like day three of eating eggs, I woke up in a completely different skin. Like, I, I don't even know how to describe what this is like, but when you've spent years with your arms and legs hurting every time you move them at all, and suddenly it was like, oh wow, I can bend my arms and nothing hurts. And you just think, wow, what have I done? done but that wasn't normal and i thought it was so that went away overnight so there were things like that that just kind of evaporated the moment i had oh you know a little animal fat in my diet um i also had, I had D vitamins in there i mean eggs are it, yeah, yeah it's just it's they're, they're great great the vitamin d mm. and the vitamin a and all that um i also absolutely had the depression anxiety you know the exhaustion that whole sort of you know collection of you know, nasty brain problems from not having anything to build a brain with. Um, mm -hmm. And that got dramatically better as well when I, you know, started to eat a more appropriate human diet. Um, I also, of course, did the usual uh, messed up my reproductive organs um, from not having any animal fat. So mm -hmm. that was like a, a big mystery for 20 years. Like, well, why don't I have menstrual periods? That seems like a normal thing for a woman to do and I don't have them and nobody could tell me anything about it. And of course, once I come out of being a vegan and do my own research about this, it becomes quite clear. The missing piece is of course that hormones are made from cholesterol, all cholesterol. of your hormones. Cholesterol is the mother substance. It's like the base that is used to make every last one of your hormones. And mm -hmm. You know, your body has all kinds of fallback plans. There's a lot of resilience built into being alive. So 
if you don't have enough cholesterol, enough fat um, to make those kinds of hormones, what your body says is, well, we'll make all the hormones you need to stay alive moment to moment, day by day. Clearly you're half starved. No time to think about having a baby. So we're gonna shut that down and we'll only make the ones that we really need right now. You get some better food, you let us know, and we'll talk about having a baby. Until then, we're just gonna make the hormones that you need right now. Um, wow. And that's the thing. So this happens to a lot of women who are vegan, a lot of women who eat just generally low fat diets. Female athletes have this problem because their body fat ratio is way too low. Um, it seems really obvious now, but at the time, I mean, I just was mystified. Um, and that completely stabilized once I stopped being vegan, like dramatically so. And it, that was one of those like, wow, I, I am not making any of this up. I really did a, a number on myself. So I also ended up with uterine fibroids and I had to have surgery and like that whole thing as well. So yeah. not any fun. Um, all of that could have been avoided. So. You know, I think people, I am quite outspoken about this and I do it not because I'm mean or want to get, you know, some sort of reaction out of people. I do it because it's the only thing that humans notice. Um, if I write a really great post about how choline affects the brain and why eggs are so important and how vegan diets, no one will read it and no one will notice it. Um, but when I put up something like a photo or, a, you know, I get a lot of engagement, a lot of discussion. <laughs> and it's not that I am inherently against veganism. It's, it's just education. Like I, I just want to educate people so they can make more informed decisions because I don't think it's the correct way to eat. And I, and I get it all the time. Someone will comment and say, do you think that athletes can do well in a vegan diet? Like maybe some of them have done well for a year, but no, yeah. you know, like I, I don't think so. And how do you know what they eat every day? Well, the other, other two things. One is that they have bodies that were not built by a vegan diet. Mm. They eat tons, you can, you know, they had normal diets when they were growing up. It might have been bad in some ways, like, you know, the standard American diet, but there was mm. meat and eggs and milk and whatever involved in, in building that body that they now have. They mm. might decide as an adult, okay, I'm going to be a vegan now, but that body was not built. I've seen those children. I know how bad they look when they get to be teenagers. Like, it's yeah. there's no way. Their teeth are an absolute mess. You know, they're scrawny. They're never going to achieve their full human height that they would have. Like, you can't, that's not going to happen. So... You know, there's that's problem number one. And problem number two is that even if they're trying to be vegans now, you know, being athletes, um, they're eating a lot of essentially industrially produced foods, it's like all those mm. protein batters that might be made from Franken foods, we call it. Right. Yeah. Like that's yeah. not something you're going to go outside and hunt and bring home and eat that doesn't exist outside of, you know, industrial civilization. It's highly mm. processed, it's made in a factory. You can't make it in your kitchen. You can't find it, you know, out on, you know, the, the forest or pull it out of a river. This is not something that you're going to stumble up across in your backyard and eat. It's not a berry. It's not a fish. Um, it's an industrially produced, like you say, a Franken food. And that's what mm. they're eating to build some muscle mass as vegan athletes. And it, it's not food. So, yeah. You, yeah. You mentioned some really important bits that I, I think people should understand about uh mental health, depression, anxiety, and physical health, because they are one, I believe. I don't think we can kind of separate the two and say, you know, you're depressed, but it's not because you're unfit or because you're unhealthy. It's because you, it's probably a combination of all those things. And there are a couple of simple rules that we tell patients. One is the body wants to heal. You just have to give it the right inputs. And if it's not healing, likely you are giving it the wrong inputs, right? Um, your central nervous system controls a lot of things that you have no direct input over like your stress hormones right and your brain is primed for survival it will prioritize itself and it will always try to survive and it's not very good at looking into the future it just wants to survive now so if you yeah. don't have, and as a female like the the menstruation cycles and pregnancy one of the biggest stresses is creating another human and i see it you know mums will come to us after the third pregnancy they've, they've experienced a dip in resources and they've never dug themselves out and then another dip then another dip and by the third child they are really really unhealthy and that's the brain opting for survival you have to give your system more resources to heal not soy 
no, plants plants don't really nourish you that much they might feed your gut microbiome and and do some good things but you know sus like real nourishment um you mentioned the case of, i forget the name of the african tribe who pretty much drinks blood drinks yeah. milk and eats yeah. meat yep yeah that's nourishment that's nourishment and there's lots of people like that in our our ancestral history so yeah mm. well the thing to remember is that muscle meat contains anywhere from 10 to 100 times more nutrients than any plant you could name. And then the organ meats, again, 10 to 100 times more nutrients than the muscle meat. So that's where the real nutrients are. And we have moved so far away from this for most of us, you know, in, in our in our culture that unless you have like a, you know, a real ethnicity where people are hanging on to their traditional food, it's gone. I mean, I never right. ate organ meats when I was growing up. We had a liverwurst every once in a while and that was it. Um, and I, you know, I have friends certainly who ate um, like chopped liver as kids, but that's about it. And mm. I mean, that's what made us human was eating things like animal brains. That's what let our, our brains expand. The really, mm. the good stuff, you know, the done stuff. I even see it with my dogs you know, when they eat in the morning, it's, they will preferentially eat out any organ meats that are in there and the egg yolk. That's the first thing they eat. And then they'll move on to the, like the, the muscle like they know it's amazing to watch every single morning it's the first thing they pull out of that dish yeah what's an average day of eating for you look like um i eat like a sort of, i guess basically like a, a keto kind of paleo diet so mm. um breakfast is usually broth and eggs and then lunch is usually some kind of beef or fish um with some vegetables like i'll have some salad at that point um, and then I don't usually eat dinner because of the gastroparesis thing. I still get a stomach ache if I eat at night, but I'll have like my last sort of snack, sort of smallish meal at maybe three or four o'clock. And that'll be kind of more of the same. Um, mm. I'm not a big fruit eater. I just people I know who love fruit. I don't really get fruit. I just don't understand it. Like why? Mm. <laughs> I just am not hungry for fruit. Um, I do like chocolate. That's my downfall. So it's, you know, you try to keep that to a dull kind of dull roar, but that's, if I'm going to eat a sugary thing, it's, chocolate so yeah that's pretty much you know my thing and i am lucky because i live in a rural area so i have access to absolutely fabulous like grass-fed beef really good quality eggs i've had chickens and goats myself i don't currently have those but i have had all kinds of fowl and then the goats too which is a lot of fun um uh, but I also i have access to we have actually have a cheese factory in my tiny little town <sighs> and they i know it's amazing and there's nothing here except this cheese factory and they are really committed to buying local grass-fed milk from you know local dairies, and they have really really good cheese. Mm. So I can go downtown and just get super good quality cheese, just like that. It's right there, and it's really cheap. So Amazing. I'm very very lucky. And I also live right on the coast, so there's a lot of seafood available that's harvested that day. I'm like two miles from the ocean, so it's really easy. So I know mm. that I'm incredibly lucky, and all of that. A lot of people don't have access to anything like that and yeah i i do so i mean you definitely wrote the book i'm assuming after you started to eat animals again oh, yeah. because your mental acuity <laughs> would have improved um <laughs> in terms of those health conditions and in particular like the mental health anxiety depression do you feel better eating protein animals fats yeah and i think for some of us it's really dramatic that i think i think once you've kind of done this to your brain um, it's kind of semi-permanent. It, it only takes a few hours for me of not eating a good chunk of kind of solid animal protein of some kind. And honestly, it starts coming back around the edges. You know, I'll find myself feeling incredibly fragile and slightly depressed, and I'm sort of on the edge of the void. It's like, I could so easily just push myself right over that and <laughs> decide that everything is terrible. And, um, nice money. Um, so, and then it's like, oh, I just need to eat. Like, yeah. I know what's wrong. If I just eat an egg or a burger, everything will be fine. And generally, it is. So, that's your tail. Why are we she's barking? A, she's <laughs> a owner back. Well, oh, you know, it's because somebody's driving down the driveway. I know why it is. Can you grab her a chew stick? Thank you. We'll make her be quiet. Here's your tail. She had surgery a few weeks ago, so I can't let her out yet. She's not quite uh, ready for her. For running, yeah, she busted her um, her cruciate ligament in the knee, which is a thing that especially large dogs do. 
So she yeah. had to have surgery. So she's over the worst of it, but she's not allowed to be free yet. I can't just let her out to run around. So uh, um, poor thing. Besides to have a bark session, I can't just throw her out the door. Yeah. Anyway, somebody has applied a chew stick, so now she's going to be. She's fine. fine. Um, yeah. It's kind of like you and the egg, right? It is. Apply like, the oh, egg. <laughs> apply the egg, you'll feel better. It's like apply the chew stick. So she is right now eating a. You know they have bullies. I don't know. Do you have dogs? Are you into dogs at all? Me, uh, we, I don't have dogs at the moment. I grew up with a German Shepherd. Oh, um, good. My partner has a Doberman. Um, love dogs. I just don't have one at the moment. Definitely. Well, she has a bully stick right now. And that, that'll keep her busy for five minutes. So. There you go. Yeah, yeah um, we've got, I mean, 8,000, not a huge database, but we've got enough people that are really interested in nutrition that, you know, your message matters. Um, if you were to rewind 20, 25 years, <laughs> And, and again, these, these are not words coming from me. So I don't want people to be on the page like Marco, stop telling us to, cause I say it all the time. And so I feel it loses its power yeah. um, from somebody who has, cause I've never been a vegan, right? Uh, for, but for somebody who has been a vegan for so long and m written a book about it, which is, is a huge task. Um, what would you say to yourself? And then what would you say to these, you know, good people who are considering going down that route? Well, you're not going to save animals. You're not going to save the planet. You're not going to feed hungry people. And you're not going to help your health. You will, in fact, do way more damage eating that diet to all of those things. In fact, none of it turns out to be true. And I would beg people, you don't have to believe me, but it's do more research before you get into this because there's so much more information out there right now than when I was 16 years old and took this up. I really didn't know better. But now there's so much good stuff out there that will walk you through this, like how it is we can actually restore the planet. And it does not involve being a vegan. Agriculture mm -hmm. is the worst thing that humans have done to the planet. This is not the diet of peace and sustainability and compassion. It's not, it's the worst thing. So like ask bigger questions, get the better information before you make this decision. Uh, you can still be somebody who cares very deeply about animals and the earth and human beings and how to how to do a how to have a better way how to live a better way all of that those are the central questions to being alive right now because our planet is really on the brink so the yeah. values behind this are completely correct but you have the wrong information that that's what I would say yeah just misguided I feel yes. And I, I might add one there, um, vote with your dollar and, and make effort to go and source your food. Like don't just limit it to the local supermarket, find a farmer, yeah. find somebody you can support, pay a little bit more, um, you know, do something meaningful with your money rather than just not eating uh, yeah. meat. Because it unfortunately because doesn't work. If, if they're doing the right thing, I mean, they've got permanent pasture everywhere. so. They're sequestering car carbon. They're making habitat for all kinds of birds and mammals. And they're helping to restore the local waterways. So there's fish are gonna be happier, water tables being recharged. Like, and then every every single year they are sequestering carbon by building soil. That's the only way we're gonna get that carbon out of the atmosphere is by restoring grasslands of whatever kind. It is the only way forward. And yeah. every time you buy beef or whatever from a grass-based farm, you are doing that, are helping in that process. So yeah. try to understand what I just said. Like there's so much good research out there right now, but I'm telling you the truth about this. Like this is our hope. So spend your dollars wisely because you can help be part of the solution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if people want to, uh, well, if you're a patient of ours and, and you're watching this with a live or the replay and you want the book, just let me know and we'll send you a copy. Um, otherwise, if people want to read uh, more of what you do post regularly, do you do any emails or anything like that? At the moment, um, I'm on Facebook, um, and I mean, you can almost go to my website and look, you know, look at my books or whatever. It's I'm easy to get a hold of. Awesome, yeah. I was really surprised that you even responded to me. I remember just shooting the message, being like, oh, "I'll just try it." Um, but it, yeah, the the book really did have a big impact on me and a lot of our patients. So I, I appreciate. It. There's a few staple books that I send to people. One of them is the Vegetarian Myth. Another one is um, Lost Connections by Johan Hari, <clears throat> just about mental health, anxiety. <clears throat> and and a few others, but those two are the biggest ones. So if you're a patient, you want to 
we'll send it over to you complimentary um otherwise if you haven't read the vegetarian myth i couldn't recommend it more it's absolutely awesome thanks for doing this you're very welcome thanks for having me on we'll hopefully do it again sometime um sure. and talk about uh other issues like autoimmune but i think we covered some good stuff today and i think people can take away with some knowledge and good luck with the elections thank you yeah it, it'll be over soon <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right yeah thank you very much all right bye-bye